Hello, everybody. Thanks for joining us today on the Key to Budgeting Success webinar. We're going to uh, begin right now. Uh, Alan, if you want to move ahead. Okay, again, thanks everybody for joining us. Uh, I, we'll begin by doing an overview of who the presenters are. I'm Margaret Wilson. I'm a senior account executive with TGO Consulting, and we're hosting this webinar for you today. And we've got uh, a few presenters that uh, have some expertise in the whole budgeting space that are going to speak to uh, some best practices and address some of your questions. So with me, I have Alan Whitehouse, who is the Chief Software Architect for TrueSky. TrueSky is a, um, a Tier 1 budgeting solution. We've got Walter, Walter Stuthers, who's a CFO of Gamma Tynacare Medical Laboratories, and Walter Tora, VP of Consulting Services with Litcom. So just a quick quick uh, housekeeping and agenda. We're going to go over the, uh, we're going to do a presentation. Obviously, we're going to keep the phones on mute uh, because it gets very distracting. But we do want to try to make this as interactive as possible. So what we'd like you to do is please uh, feel free. There's a question box. You can submit your questions there, and we will, uh, we will answer those more, most likely at the end. Um, and also, we will have an opportunity to raise your hand, and we can unmute certain people at the end. Um, but uh, generally, throughout the presentation, we're going to be keeping the phones on mute. And sorry, I think we're having a little problem with our display. Yeah, I think I'm just getting the, the right Hopefully thing, everyone. so I'm hoping everyone is now seeing the slides that they should be seeing. All right. Okay, so... As I said, the, the best and most efficient way is to submit your questions through the GoToMeeting interface, but um, we will try to do the, the hand raising at the end as well. Okay. All right, with that, uh, uh, this is uh, Alan Whitehouse, and hopefully you'll get to recognize some of the voices. I'm going to kind of lead the, the discussion on and, and start by doing some overview with some slides, and then we're going to have our, our two... Uh, panelists uh, kind of hop in with some, some comments and, and thoughts as we go through. Um, again, uh, feel free to put your uh, questions into the, the, the chat interface. Because of the large number of people that we have, we'll answer those at the end um, rather than try to, to, to handle them in, in real time. But we will get to all of your questions as we go through. So kind of to set the stage, um, I like to start this discussion um, around why do we budget? Well. There's a couple reasons. So first of all, the answer that comes up, and if you ask a lot of end users this, it's because we have to. Now that's not really a, you know, that can seem like a little bit of a flippant answer, but in some situations it is, you know, some end users, you know, the thought is because we have to. But from an organizational point of view, there are a lot of reasons why organizations do actually have to budget. So uh, first of all, maybe you have covenants with your bank or your financial institution that you have to show projections of where you're going to be next quarter, next year, next month, and so forth. And without a budget, you can't meet your covenants, and therefore loans and lines of credits get pulled. Uh, maybe you have industry or government regulations where you have to provide information back to them um, to be compliant uh, with the law. Um, and probably the most common reason is because you have ownership or board of directors that are not involved in the day-to-day -day operations of the organization, but they have oversight into what goes on and they make high-level decisions. So those are all valid reasons as to why we budget. Why else do we budget? Well, for many people, the reason they budget is related to financial predictability. Um, you want to be able to plan for cash flow. It's great if you have unbelievably high sales, but if your costs are higher or you go negative in cash flow at the end of the year, you know that's a problem. So you do it for financial uh, predictability and cash flow. Maybe you need to plan your purchasing. Uh, if you have lead times 
Uh, you order items from overseas, and there is a six, eight week, 12 week kind of lag time from when you order to when you receive it. You need to be able to have that in order to predict it. So that way you can you know, pay to have it shipped by boat rather than pay by air and lose all of your profit margin. The other reason people budget on the financial predictability side is to help hedge their risk. Uh, if you know you're going to need a large amount of a commodity item, for instance, you might go out and buy futures for that item uh, and hedge your risk in that area. People budget to help understand uh, their business drivers. Um, you know, the really um, to get an idea of you know what should change in your budget. What does that mean to changes in your limited resources? You know, as an organization, you all have a limited number of resources, whether that be people, whether that be warehouse space, whether that be time. Uh, and being able to understand that budget and what affects those, you know how to uh, adjust accordingly. Um, it helps you decide if you need to hire or fire people. Helps you need to decide if you need to do subcontracting. Um, helps you decide if you need to open or close new facilities. Those are all reasons of why you budget. And finally, you know, people budget in order to manage performance. Uh, in most organizations, uh, individuals are somehow held accountable to some type of plan. Uh, and many times that is a financial plan or that is a component of it. So you budget to help manage people's performance. So you know, those are kind of some of the, 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 the general things. I think at, at this point I'm going to turn it over to uh, Walt and then Walter uh, to maybe discuss uh, a little bit of the reasons why the organizations, why like Gamma Dynacare uh, and Litcom and, and some of their clients why they budget, and you know what do they do in that budgeting process? Yeah, I think one of the the, the key points is that to really leverage budgeting, it it, it, it it can't be an isolated, top-down exercise by the finance department. Um, the way we use budgeting, it's really an integral part of our planning process. It, it's sort of part of the annual planning cycle, comes towards the end of it. Um, and it really helps us with decisions around real resource allocation. I mean, we have key initiatives that we need to deliver to sort of hit financial targets, but also operational goals and long-term strategic goals that need to be addressed. Um, so there's, there's, there's typically a lot of conflicting demands on the discretionary resources that we have, and, and the budgeting process allows us to have a fairly formal and organized and also open process where um, we're able to make hopefully sensible decisions that are that are um, in, in alignment with uh, the overall strategic goals of the company. Great, um, Walter. Do you have uh, anything you'd like to comment on there as to to the organizations that you work with? Why why they budget? Uh, certainly, um, Alan. Thank you. Um, you know, I think Walt really you know focused it on the the most important aspect, which is linking the budget to the strategic plan and the strategic goals of the organization, but I think uh, you know, an important side benefit that many of our customers see in, in creating a budget and going through that budgeting process is to, you know, to create um, you know, various, you know, for example, operational metrics that can then that would then drive some of the, the financial performance, and that just provides greater insight into what those um, uh, business drivers are, so that as the you know if the budget does stray from or the actual does stray from the budget. Um, you know, you're able to do things like um, you know analyze uh, price or cost and volume, and uh, you know, understand the relationships between between those items. So um, it, uh, you know it's a really significant you know way to gain great insight into how the business performs. All right, great, thank you. So let's review, and then we'll have some more discussion on the elements of a budget. Uh, and again, yours may be a little bit different, but I think what I'm going to go through here is pretty much common across all the budgets, no matter what your industry is, no matter um, you know what process you're using for budget. I think you'll see some of these things that, that come in common here. Well, they kind of have, I guess, three main categories or, 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 or pillars when we talk about a budget. The first is the, the, the people component, and that really is made up of involvement, accountability, and time. Um, really, when it comes down to it, you know, it, to be successful in your budgeting, you need to have people involved in the process. And that's not just their physical involvement, that is their mental involvement and to some degree their emotional involvement. The more they are involved in the process, the more they have that ownership, the better you're going to find your budget will be at the end of the day. Along with that, uh, from an organizational point of view, 
you need to have accountability with the budget. You know, people need to be held accountable to the numbers. That may, it's kind of that way to force them to put in numbers that they believe are sound, that they've thought through, and so forth. Finally, you need to make sure that you give the people the time to do the budget. Uh, in many organizations, you know, the budget only happens maybe once a year or twice a year, uh, although I, I tend to recommend doing it more than that. Um, but because of that, people are trying to shoehorn in getting their budget done within the the day-to-day -day business of everything else they need to do. Uh, and again, the more time people have to actually think about the budget, the more successful that budget will be. Along with the, the, kind of the next pillar of the budget is the what I call the data. And that's actually the, the, the numbers that you get in. And that is composed of uh, the, these four um, sub-elements. Uh, first of that is, is detail. Um, you know, and each organization is a little bit different as to what level of detail uh, that needs to be captured that is right for them. Uh, as a general rule, the more detail you can capture, the better. However, there is a cost to doing that because it tends to take a little bit more effort because you can always roll up detail, but you can't make detail when none exist. So again, making sure you have the right level of detail to move yourself forward is, is of critical importance. Drivers. Um, in many organizations that I work with, I see people only budgeting dollars. So they budget their, their expenses, they budget their revenues. But they don't get into the, the details of that. And that can have severe consequences. You know, you can say I'm going to hit $10 million a year in revenue. But what that means to your organization, if that is 10 million units sold or 1 million units sold, can have a dramatic difference in the other side, like your operations. So you know, getting down to that whole concept of the drivers uh, is, is of critical importance when you're doing budgeting. External information. Um, none of us live in a vacuum. And when you are composing your budget, you need to make sure you take into account all of the items that are out there um, that are going on in the world around you. Uh, so what new business regulations are coming down? What is going on in the economy that affects you? What is your competition doing? All of these things need to be taken into account when you're doing the budget. And, and too often, that kind of gets uh, left by the wayside. And finally is timeliness. And that's not to be confused with time. Uh, timeliness means you know how up to date is the information that you have uh, in your budget. So if you're providing people things like actuals uh, from last period, uh, are these uh, numbers three months old or are they three days old? Uh, many of the times I see people that are working with Excel, this is a common problem, that the data, by the time they get all their Excel templates done, um, their data is outdated uh, and it's months old, which makes it more difficult to make decisions. And I think uh, in, in a minute Walter might discuss a little bit about that with, with their experience. And the final pillar is your budgeting process. And that really comes down to, to these six areas, which is accessibility. Again, kind of goes, <coughs> excuse me, hand in hand with involvement. You know, how accessible is the budgeting information, is the budgeting system, whatever that system may be, um, whether it be part of your ERP, whether it be Excel, whether it be a budgeting solution, how accessible is that for end users to work with and for managers to work with? Um, and again, if it's, it's very difficult to access, it's going to be, you know, affect the quality of your, your numbers. Um, from a security point of view, um, is your data secure or is your data too secure? And you can actually go to both extremes on that. Um, and if you don't give people enough information because you're worried about security, they can't do their job right. But if you give them too much, you risk getting information out into the open that you may want, not want to be uh, widely known. Um, visibility. Um, do the people that are managing the process, do the uh, approvers of these numbers, do they have visibility throughout um, the system? Do they have visibility why people are doing inputs into the system? You know, can this be a collaborative work environment rather than just waiting for people to, to put their numbers in and, and wait to the end of the day? Confidence. Um, at the end of the day, when you're all said and done, do you have confidence that your numbers are correct? Have all your numbers rolled up? Have people put in the correct numbers? Uh, did they put in a million dollars when they meant to put in $100,000? Do you trust those, those numbers? Duration. Um, you know, really, how long is your budgeting process? You know, ideally, you should be striving to get very short duration budgeting process. That way the data is fresh, everything is fresh in everyone's mind. And that kind of goes hand in hand with frequency. You know, in your perfect world, you should have short duration budgeting cycles and be doing them on a quite a regular basis rather than this one budgeting process that goes for four months that happens once a year. And at the end of the day, you know, a breakdown in any of those areas 
ultimately will have a negative effect on the accuracy of your budget. So at this point, I'm going to kind of turn it over first to um, uh, Walter um, to kind of discuss some of their um, his feelings and things that he's seen um, when doing uh, budgets um, that kind of relates to this, and then we'll to we'll or, uh, uh, then we'll go to to Walter after that. So Walter, I'll turn it over to you. Yeah, I mean, I think to your point that on the on the timeliness, we used to have a fairly distributed um, budgeting process that was Excel based and. We built the templates in July, we distributed them at the end of August, and we started the budgeting process in September using July data. So it was, and, and September for us is really the relevant month. Um, so in terms of sort of indi an indicator for the upcoming year. So we, we really were sort of blind going into the, into the budgeting process. Um, the other challenge we had was that once we got all these hundreds of templates back in, just uploading them, um, into the financial system was a logistical nightmare, I and mean, it was highly error prone. I mean, as any Excel-based project was, um, but really slow. I mean, it, I think it took three days um, just to do the upload. So it was just just to get a report generated um, on the information we had was somewhat cumbersome, and we spent most of the time, I think it like completing the templates probably took a month to six weeks and then it probably took another month just to figure out where all the errors were. Um, so the first three months of the budget process were, were very non-value added. Um, so it was it was frustrating, also um, very tough on the staff involved, um, very long hours, everything was a crisis constantly. Um, automating the process, which I think we're going to get into yeah. later, um, yeah, that was that has, has changed things dramatically. Yeah, I think we'll touch on that. Um, not to jump too far ahead, but um, Gamma Data Care invested in a tool um, to help get them off of Excel. That took away a lot of the, the the pains that they were having here. And I think as we get to the next slide, we'll go through that a little bit, and, and Walt can give some more real life examples of what a tool, you know, really any structured budgeting solution tool can bring to you as an organization. So, um, Walter, I think I'll. Uh, let you pipe in here a little bit. I think you had some uh, discussions about materiality and, and, and that kind of thing when your level of detail and, and, and so forth um, in a budget. Um, yeah, the, the clients where we've implemented budgeting systems at have been, you know, really after you know best practices in budgeting. And you know, at the at the end of the day, the budget you know is part of a, an overall annual business planning process, so that you know the budget has to align with uh, the financial system. Uh, so you know, off our clients are comparing budget against actual. So as Walt mentioned, you know, loading the data into the um, you know your your financial system to do that kind of monthly monitoring and reporting is really important. And what we see some clients try to do is is, is almost do budgeting at at every line level in the general ledger, which is you know a tremendous amount of time for you know in a lot of cases very little uh, little payback uh, budgeting at a very detailed level. And and, and what are Clients are doing is, you know, analyzing their costs and revenues and, and identifying those significant costs, you know, using uh, some materiality guidelines depending on the size of the organization to streamline budgeting by by focusing on the key cost drivers and the key revenue drivers uh, for the business to, to simplify it, but still align all budgets with, uh, you know, with with how financial reporting um, occurs, so that there's there's always that feedback process of comparing budget to actual to to um, you know, really do a do a check on the confidence. That are the numbers as they expected, um, etc. So, um, always looking to simplify and, and, and leverage uh, tools to support the process. Great. I'll um, pipe in there on um, on one thing you mentioned about materiality with a real life example of, 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 a, of a, a client that I'd worked with. You know, they had at the end of the day they had a budget uh, that was probably you know, fifty million dollars. You know, they're a couple hundred million dollar organization. Yet they would spend time approving and debating their postage costs. For the end of the year, their postage costs were probably about three thousand dollars. Yet they spent that time, you know, approving it, saying, "No, you got to lower this. You got to raise it." And it was such a minuscule portion of it that they probably ate up more of that time than when they went over, even if they doubled or tripled their postage, and just debating the amount. That they were going to spend in that area, so I think you make a great point there. That uh, to really focus on, you know, to get people involved and everything else, focus on those items that matter, that are going to make a material difference in your bottom line, 
and let the other let the the chips you know fall where they will uh, in regards to the other areas. All right. Let's talk a little bit about um, kind of a typical versus an ideal type budget cycle. And I think at the start we had a um, a poll that said how many of you were using Excel for your budgeting. I think it was about three quarters more or less were using Excel for this. So I think a little bit of what we're, we're going to show here will really um, uh, come to play here when we go through this. But let's say you're doing a once a year budget. What you're going to see at the top of the screen here is pretty typical and probably something you're very familiar with. Um, you know, typically maybe a four month budgeting cycle that happens once a year. Maybe it starts in September if you're on a calendar year. And you spend a lot of time up front creating input templates. And I think this is something that Walt will discuss a little bit, you know, what they faced earlier on. Um, and that's, you know, creating a different template for each user, for each department, for each manager, depending on how you deal with security. And in some cases it might be dozens, uh, might be hundreds, uh, depending on the size of your organization. And then you're having to manage and roll all those out. Then again, you have to try to get, spend a lot of time getting your people to, to do budget input. And again, because of constraints on their time, because budgeting is not necessarily the number one priority everyone wants, it takes a while to get that input done. Then you've got to do a quick review of those numbers. And then you've got to start that, that, that very painful process of merging all of those numbers back together. And with Excel, that can be a nightmare because people have deleted rows, they've added columns, they've changed formulas and so forth. And then, you know, you're down to the final days of when you have to get your budget submitted to the board and everything gets rushed. And that's where the, the, the value added stuff. You know, now what you should be striving for, and I think what we're going to get some commentary and, and how you can kind of discuss some of this, is a, is a cycle that looks a little bit more like what we see on the bottom screen, where you've got templates that are reusable, recyclable, that you don't have to create each and every time. Uh, that you structure things such that your users can get their input done quicker, um, that you can take away that merge component completely. But really, what you do is, and, and what's different is that yellow box down there, where you actually have the time to do analysis on your numbers and strategize about your numbers, rather than just collect the numbers. So with this, I think I'll um, turn it first over to Walt, and I think he's going to give a little bit of insight as to what their life was like uh, before they had a budgeting solution when they were using just Excel. Um, and maybe you can start by telling about, you know, a little bit more about how many departments, how many different locations they were doing budgets for, and then what they've been able to accomplish now that they've got a tool and what they could do that they couldn't do with just Excel by itself. Well, I guess um, for us, we're, we're, we're fairly tightly managed as a, as a business from a financial performance perspective. Um, in, in terms of the expectations we have from our board. Um, so we, we would always start the budgeting process off with sort of, and we continue to do this, with sort of a high level, okay, what, what's going to be acceptable this year? What, what can we defend? What can we deliver? And that process always moved in parallel with the bottom-up um, process that we use from the departments. With the process I described earlier where we spent a month building templates, um, a month getting the templates completed, and then a month actually fixing all the errors before we actually saw anything. Um, what typically happened was we would try and gather information using a parallel process to see where we were. So we would be constantly guessing through the process, constantly tweaking to understand. And it was really at the very end of the process um, that we would sort of compare what we'd actually got in the, in the, in the bottom of budgets with where we thought we needed to be. And the gap was typically huge. So we'd then start to have to throw sort of huge numbers at the departments to say, well, this, this isn't acceptable. We need you to cut here, 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 and here. And it was a scramble. And it was a knee-jerk reaction, basically, to a whole lot of stuff. So there wasn't really a lot of planning. There wasn't a lot of dialogue. There wasn't a lot of communication. It was very much, we don't care. We can't do it. Um, the process we've moved to, which is essentially completely automated, I mean, the, the template creation takes a couple of days. Um, I can't remember how many hundred departments it is. You probably have yeah, to if, if I remember correctly, when you were on Excel, you were creating about 450 different workbooks to manage you know, across because it was different location times different department. Yeah. So um, we have laboratories across the country. We have chemistry, hematology, 
microbiology, histology, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So of those departments had its own revenue numbers and its own, its own costs and its own budget. So plus obviously all the administrative departments as well. So the, 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 the way it works now is we've identified a number of, of drivers. So uh, materials cost is, is the ob obvious example. We start off, we, ter we um, get from sales the, the revenue forecast by division, by, by region, by, by client. We convert that into volumes and convert that into materials. So the, the, the departments themselves don't have to worry about their materials costs. We have planning guidelines for staff productivity. So again, we convert that all into, from a, a direct cost perspective, we know how many uh, based on our productivity levels, we know how many staff we're going to need. So that's sort of the starting point for the departments. They've got they've got their target um, eight, eight, um, FTEs and they've got their target materials costs. So there's there's very little for them to do from a um, from the material planning stuff other than validate what what the system is, <laughs> and then also understand um, what what other things they 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 need to be need to get done, and this is a point of the um, part of the planning process, they will have been um, told, okay, we've got a new microbiology platform coming in over the next six months, what resources do you need for that? So they're really layering on, okay, if we're doing this project, this project, and this project, here's, here's what it's going to look like. So it's, it's not a scramble, it's, it's very informed that the information is up to date that they're using. It's also, because the system is, is real time, when a department's done, we see that information throughout throughout the organisation. So there's there's actually a constant review happening throughout the um, probably it's a, a, a thirty to forty day process where the departments are actually building their budget, and it's getting reviewed continually. So it's not like it's done and dumped on us after a month or forty days. Um, by the time the, the departments have uh, finished their um, budgets. That they've, that it's been vetted multiple times by the finance, by the, 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 the VP of that area, et cetera, et cetera. So we're getting a fairly high quality product. There is some review. We do challenge. Obviously, we, we run metrics. But once the input's finished, it's really, it really comes down to, um, OK, what, what, what does this look like? And what can we sensibly afford? So we had a list of you know, 15 to 20 things that the strategic plan and the operating goals that we have to deliver on. Um, can we realistically afford them? So a lot of the analysis is really a discussion on refining our planning for the upcoming year as opposed to worrying too much about the budget because we, through the process we've identified a lot of the discretionary spend which is typically project related. In addition to that, um, at the same time we'll have discussions around, okay, we've got what can we do from a productivity perspective? Like, what new platforms are out there? What other things can we do? And there's a discussion on if the numbers aren't where we need to be, okay, maybe this is the time to automate this component of microbiology. What is the impact? What are the timing? You know, something we may have done, waited a year, we can bring ahead. But it gets incorporated into that 30-day analysis. The, another big part of the value there is we have so much dialogue between senior management and operations and, and, and the relatively junior operations staff, the managers and the directors, that um, there's a huge information sharing. So I think whereas before the budgeting process was really operations was a black box and the corporate finance goals were a black box and there was really not a lot of dialogue between the two, now I think the, at the executive level we have a much better understanding of the challenges and needs of the business what's required to implement some of the goals and, and, and targets that, that, that we need to deliver. And I think the organization has a much better sense of what the priorities are. I mean, it's a fantastic way of communicating strategic priorities. So we get to the end of the process, I think, with a, with a much more aligned budget, a, a, a budget that is actually deliverable, where we have pretty much all the players in the process bought in to what's going to be done next year. So it's, and it's, Painless. I mean, the budgeting for us is not long nights. It's it's just part of the normal work day. Um, the reports are there. The the, the 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 analysis is straightforward. A lot of it's automated. So budgeting is is not a nightmare. It's 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 not one of these things. It's like oh my god, we're going into budgeting. It's it's just another day at work. I think I think you touched on one of the things that I think is critical for a successful budget, and that's the you call it dialogue. I call it collaboration. Um, that. You know, people across the organization, whether it's horizontal, you know, people in different departments being able to share information about what their thoughts are about where things are going, or working with people above them 
while the budget's happening. So rather than everyone doing their own little component in isolation and submitting it to the next person who does their stuff in isolation, submitting it to the next person, it sounds like you guys have a good back and forth, back and forth while it's going on. So there's no surprises at the end of the day. No, it's, it's a, there's collaboration yeah. is built throughout the entire process and it's, it's assisted by the fact that everyone has access to the same data. Yeah, and I don't think that's fine. And that's tough to do if you're just using straight Excel because, again, everyone's in their own little vacuum there. So, um, Walter, I think you had some, some thoughts on this and also changing to maybe, you know, driver-based budgeting and one of those big switches and what that can do for you as an organization. Sure. You know, I think the, um, the client that we, where we implemented, a, a, you know, a best practices budgeting uh, process supported by an automated tool was was really trying to achieve exactly the same thing that, that Walt alluded to in terms of you know providing transparency throughout the process um, and and their process was much longer they're they're budgeting they're using over a thousand spreadsheets that had to be you know first created and and uh, one of the big advantages that they found of leveraging the tool during that process is one you know streamlining um, defining what those drivers are. Um, and then linking them to the financial system. So, you know, as the chart of accounts changed or the organization changed, you know, the, the process to create the templates was, was much more streamlined. You know, fewer accounts and, uh, and drivers means, um, you know, fewer items that need to be input and also, you know, the, all the challenges of maintaining those spreadsheets from year to year as the organization changes, as a new line of business is created or um, two, you know, two legal entities, entities are consolidated for tax purposes. That becomes a much more straightforward and simpler process, as well as, as linking the actuals and last year's budget to, um, to what's being budgeted for this year. So, um, you know, it, it provided a tremendous opportunity to collapse the, you know, instead of budgeting process starting in uh, in March, which which they were doing, you know, that pushed that budgeting start process out to September for them, and and freed them to focus on the analyze and, and strategize area, um, um, you know, much more effectively. And I think you've also got some um, some examples, again, of, of something I'm a big believer in, is trying to push the budget out to more people in the organization, um, you know, where each person maybe does a smaller portion, but they're closer to the action. It's the, the, the component that they know. Absolutely. It's where the accountability rests, whether it's a department manager, a center, or a, um, you, know, uh, you know, somebody who's managing a profit center and pushing out. Um, that that information, and as, as Walt mentioned, a really important point. You know, the big the, the, the transparency of the budgeting process when that occurs. You're not you know, in an Excel-based world. You know, somebody owns that spreadsheet and is working on it until it's done, and then the next person sees it. So, um, you know, the automated the benefit of the automated tool that this organization saw was as budgets were in process. You know, the line the managers that are you know going to review and approve aggregated budgets, for instance. Are seeing what's happening, or right? are able to, you know, interject quickly if, um, you know, some of the assumptions may not be correct, or um, or speed the process along, or provide some support um, for some individuals that may be struggling in their budgeting process. Okay, well, let me and, and let me highlight on something. Then, then we'll. Uh, I want to talk about analysis and, and strategy. You know, one of the big things that you know the downside of, of blowing that out to a lot of different people, although I think you get better numbers, is that merge. And that's probably, I think, for people that use Excel, maybe the most painful of the process is trying to get all of those numbers back into a cohesive budget. And unfortunately, if you are using Excel, there is no magic bullet for that. You know, you can do a lot with, with good linking of formulas between worksheets, and you can actually even use formulas to link workbooks. But it's still one of the, the downfalls of using Excel. So that's one of those things as, as an organization, if you are using, um, you know, Excel and, and you're finding that merge painful, then moving to like a, a formal solution, I think, saves a lot of people time and effort. But at the end of the day, um, you know, unless you spend the time to do analysis, unless you spend the time to strategize around your numbers, doing the budget is just a make work effort. And I think it's really, that's the whole point of, of doing a budget. And I think sometimes in many organizations, they lose sight of that, you know, they got to get through the budget, but they don't think about why they're doing the budget. And I think, um, you know, uh, both Walt and Walter might have some um, comments here. I'll turn it over to, to Walt first. To talk a little bit about, you know, what they look at, how they, at the end of the day, what are, what kind of things are they analyzing? Why do they do the analysis, uh, and, and so forth? 
I, I think there's a, a couple of levels of analysis. I mean, um, the as I mentioned, that the, the productivity numbers are pretty much predetermined, but we do validate them with the with the department man managers. If we get pushback on some of our assumptions on on why something isn't going to happen, that th th those are sort of they're not really sidebar conversations, but they're areas where we put financial resource to say, okay, let's figure this out. Let's let's make sure the assertions are right, and if they're not right. Um, what can we do? The, the other piece is um, some of the um, through through the planning process, we may not necessarily have delved too deeply into a specific project or a specific initiative that we want to um, implement. The, this will sort of allow the department managers, the various department managers involved, to see what the implications are in terms of what they're being asked to deliver for the coming year from an operation perspective as, as well as the um, as, the, as well as the projects initiatives that they have to do, and, it, and it, the, that that's really to me the the, the 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 really useful thing from the from the organizational perspective is that you you get the, the the reality check. You know, can this be done? And if it can't, what do we need to change? Um, it also stimulates a lot of thinking. It's not. Um, it's, it's not sort of, okay, I've got an idea, let's just put this in and we'll figure it out. There's, there's discussion around ideas. So if, if someone thinks that they can save a million dollars doing X, Y, and Z, it doesn't just get thrown in the budget. Um, we, 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 we have time and we have the available resources to sort of go in and analyze it, whether it be at operations, finance, IT, whoever, whatever resources are there. We have enough time to sort of do a re relatively thorough analysis. Um, and because I think there's a lot more faith in the budgeting process, it's not something that's been done to folk anymore. It's, it's something that, that, that's done with them. They actually care that these are valid because they, they are held accountable for them. And they can't use the excuse that, you know, that's just a number you gave me. I've submitted my budget and it's nowhere close to what you've asked me to deliver. So don't think of holding me accountable to this. There, there is accountability. So people have a vested interest in ensuring that what they're being asked to do is valid and deliverable. So we get a lot of really good dialogue. And I think that's, the, the, that's where the education of the senior management comes in, that we, we think sometimes things are easy and we just put a button and it's done. We get to understand some of the complications of achieving what we need to achieve. It also helps us when we're um, presenting to our board because we get, when we get challenged on things, we, we have a lot better understanding of some of the obstacles and problems. So when we get that mandated, sorry, it's not good enough, we need another five million, it's like, well, that's lovely, but here's, here's what we need to not do um, if we're going to deliver on that. And you know, if we're, if we're going to cut back on our service levels for the government of Ontario, well, that's a decision you know, we're going to have to make if, if you need that money. So, so we can present more sensible discussion to the board as well, rather than just getting beaten up and, and, and not having a, a really good, valid um, set of um, consequences if we're, if we're asked for um, changes. Great. Walter, anything? Yeah, I mean, the client where we uh, implemented the, this, this tool, this is the area that they saw the biggest benefit and, and the area that they were focused on, which is when you're doing that, having those discussions about what the business priorities are and what the impact of the budget is and, and, and working through what groups have submitted, they were looking for a way to, do, um, to run multiple scenarios and do some what-if analysis. Like, what if we decide to, to grow one particular line of business by with much greater uh, marketing effort and, and drive higher volume there? You know, but doing that results in additional uh, costs to produce those products, for instance. So you, know, you, you can't do those kinds of what-if analysis using a collection of Excel spreadsheets. So um, the, the tool that they implemented you know, allowed them to create multiple scenarios during that strategize portion in order to, do, to test those scenarios to come up with, um, from their point of view, the optimal business plan that was eventually that gets eventually um, presented to the board. Um, and also during that process, in an Excel world, if if uh, different approaches are are taken to budgeting in terms of some radical changes, it's very very difficult to push those changes back out to those you know thousands of, uh, of you know different spreadsheets that are out there where the detailed data is collected. So you know it. it allows you to do that that work in a short period of time rather than doing you know a tremendous amount of uh, gymnastics with Excel to, to get at those scenarios. Great, thanks. Well I'm gonna we're running towards the end here, so I'm gonna do a couple final words and a couple final comments and we'll open it up for questions. So 
you know, at the end of the day, you know, you really want to strive to reduce your administration overhead of, of your budgeting cycle. You need to make sure that you focus on the analysis and focus on that dialogue. I like what, what Walt said to kind of paraphrase, you know, a budget you should do with people, not you shouldn't do the budget to people. Uh, I like that, that, that phrase. Um, and at the end of the day, make sure you leverage the budget to, you know, drive your business planning as well as your performance measurement. So I'll let uh, Walt and Walter have a couple of final uh, comments on that, and then I'll turn it over to Meg, who will handle some of the questions that we've uh, we've gotten during the process. Yeah, I mean, I think on a performance measurement perspective, it's high, hard to hold someone accountable for an error-prone process that they ultimately don't have final input into what they're being asked to deliver on, um, and it becomes a bit of a farce. It's, 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 um, the, the budget is wrong and, and, and institutionally it's wrong, the culture of the organization is wrong. If, if there's faith in the budget and, and the budget process is used to as part of your planning process, it, 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 it becomes possible then to measure people, uh, use that as, as a reliable measure of their performance. And I'd like to, to, to just piggyback on something Walt just said there when it talks about different people and, and, and confidence in those numbers. If you have a situation where you have multiple levels of approval and review of those numbers, you really have to decide on who owns the numbers and if, you know, who makes those changes. And if people higher up the, the food chain, so to speak, are making numbers, changes to the numbers, you need to make sure that you let the people downstream of them know what their numbers were that have been changed and why they've been changed. Otherwise, you don't have buy-in. You have people that say, you know what, those weren't my numbers. You can't hold me accountable to that. Uh, Walter, any final words? Um, yeah, like I, I, I think it's really important to uh, have transparency in place and the accountability in place. You know, then you know, ease of use of the tool to you know, create rolling quarterly forecasts, for instance. You know, just it continues to streamline the process so people are focused on the, um, the results, the accountability of the results, and on uh, an and ownership of the, of the results. Okay, great. Well, with that, I'm going to put up on the screen some uh, contact information. I think, um, Meg, are you there? Meg? Well, let me see if I can figure out. I don't know if we lost Meg. Um, so, oh. All right, so let me... Uh, go and uh, I'll see if we've got any questions. So we had one question here uh, from uh, Susan that I think was kind of in regards to um, we're doing, uh, if, if the budget was not done at the GL level, then how is it uploaded into your system, which I assume means an ERP. So I think that's kind of that, that situation where you're budgeting drivers or not budgeting at a, an SA GL level. And maybe uh, Walter Walter can comment on that. I can comment on how I've had seen clients do it and so forth. I mean, our, our, we we convert where where we where we have drivers. We we convert into what the relevant GL lines are. So when it actually hits our um, budgeting tool, um, it's 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 um, the the format is the same, or or, or the, the the level of detail is the same as in our GL. So we have all our accounts created in there. Okay. Um, so we, we, we push it down to the level the GL level of GL detail that's relevant. Okay. Um, not necessarily like for a materials cost, we may do it by department, but we may not do every single materials item. We just know it's in that department. Um, but it's but it's in there such that when you're looking at the actuals, you you can look at an ag aggregated figure that that ties into the budget. So it, it, it's it's consistent with with the GL, if not necessarily the same level of detail. Okay. Walter. Um, the client that uh, that we were working with was, you know, pushing information into the general ledger for both dollars and quantities um, at the GL account level. So, the, their particular ERP supported um, capturing that for the really significant um, uh, driver-based um, numbers that was available in the GL for reporting out of there as well. Okay. Yeah, and what I've seen, in, in, and it's not uncommon to to budget at a level of detail, whether it's greater or in more detail than your ERP. Um, you know, a little bit difficult sometimes to do in an Excel environment. If you look at a budgeting solution, a lot of them will allow you to, to 
budget at a level of detail greater and then roll it up to your ERP level. Um, but you know, you don't think about it this way. You don't always have to do all of your reporting either out of your ERP. So if you want to budget at a, at a different level and then combine that with your reporting tool, you can do that route as well. Um, so you don't always necessarily need to have a one-to-one -one GL to financial report. I think it comes down to what's relevant. Yeah. It's, it's you know, when, when you're setting, setting the goals, is, is, is it good enough or do you need more detail? And I think you, when, when you so when you're holding people accountable, you quickly learn how much detail you need to be budgeting at and, and where they need discretion. So if it's a T&E budget, you know, maybe they don't need to know every single line that's going to spend there. They've just got a T&E budget. Yeah. And I think for a lot of people, individual GL accounts kind of, even when you're budgeting, can overwhelm people, right? If you've got, you know, 10 different GL accounts related to office expenses, you know, people don't really necessarily care about copier paper versus printer paper as an extreme example, right? They just know I'm going to spend this much in office expenses. Um, and then again, if you necessarily don't need to push it back to your GL, maybe you're better off that way. So I hope that answers your question, Susan. Had another question from uh, Himanji, from and I hope I pronounced Man. Sorry, Alan, there was an issue with my mic. It seems to be fixed oh. now, if you want me to uh, jump in. So do you want to take over there? Sure. So actually, the next question that we have is uh, from Ron, uh, and he's just wondering if he can get co we, if we're going to be sending out copies of the slides. Uh, I think at the end of the, the presentation, when everyone leaves, there'll be a, a short little survey, by the way, and, and please do that because it gives us some important feedback on you know if, if this format works and, and what was useful. Uh, I think you can put a little comment there. So if you request a copy of the slides, we can send them out um, to you. Okay. Perfect. And then Hamanji, yes, he had a question. I think he's just wondering if he emails us. Uh, perhaps Hamanji, you can clarify your question. I believe you're asking if you send an email um, with some questions whether we can we can respond to those. So if, if you could clarify, that would be great. And then we have some other, um, and, and these are questions for the Waltz, so this is just the more dialogue perhaps we can talk about. Um, one of the questions is how many people are participating in your typical budgeting cycle? Well, for us, I mean, every, every department has a manager and every manager um, owns their budget. So they, we have finance support throughout the organization, not one-to-one. Not -one. I think we've probably got... Um, maybe 12 people from the finance group um, either partially or fully involved in the budget process during the process and then um, the operations folk at, you know, at various points in time. I think the finance staff do the heavy lifting um, if there's a lot of analysis needing done at the departmental level. Um, but we, we, spent, we put a lot of effort at the, when we introduced the budgeting tool that we have in training and you, ensuring that the managers at least are familiar with what's in there. Um, the other thing is we use the tool for monthly reporting. So if they need to access their uh, financials for their departments, which again, they're being held accountable for this, so they do that, um, that's the tool they use. So they're, familiar, they're, they're using our tool um, on a, on a re routine basis. It's not just something that they have access to once, once, a, uh, once a, a year. Now, outside of the finance group, the department managers also have access as well, correct? That's what I'm saying. And how many more people is that outside of the 12? Oh, gosh. Um, uh, do you know how many licenses we I think have? It's a hundred, I think it's probably over 100 if I had yeah, it's, it's, your, yeah, it's, my head. it's over 100 people that are actively involved in the budgeting, but about a dozen finance people. Okay. Walter? Um, you know, the organization that, um, that we were working with actually reorganized their finance function and created a, a real budgeting and forecasting support group that worked with their line of business. And they, they, the organization, the revenues were $1.5 billion, and you know, that group was in the 25 to 30 range. But you know, they were aligned with the various lines of business and were you know, sort of like uh, mini finance um, departments to help analyze um, budgets analyze actuals and, and, and focus on, you know, sort of ongoing business performance. Okay. hope that answers the question there. Next up, Meg? Yes, we have another question um, whether or not we're going to be uh, recording the webinar and sending that out, and that is possible. So to Alan's point earlier, if you can just indicate when you're uh, filling out the questionnaire on the way out that you'd like a copy of the recorded version, then we can make sure that's sent to you. 
And then another question just around the whole process. And I know you guys touched on this, but this is again for the waltz. What components or elements, things in the process would you eliminate if you, if you could to streamline it? Yeah, the process we have today, I think um, the, our biggest pain point is um, budgeting staff. And this comes down to the security issue. It's who has access to what. So do you want to give a junior analyst access to all your payroll information or for payroll information? So we're constantly struggling with that in terms of um, you know, the privacy we want to maintain versus the flexibility of, of budgeting and uh, ensuring those analysts are able to properly support the, uh, the team. Um, I think that it's really external to the process. The, the biggest challenge we have is, is is the discipline of the, find, of the sales organization. Our budget process starts with sales forecasts, and they're not necessarily always as rigorous as we need them to be to, to feed a meaningful operating plan. Um, so I, and I, I think some of it's training, and as we're probably in the third or fourth year, I think, of this automated budgeting process. So as, 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 as we get better at it and as our sales team gets better at forecasting and more used to it on a, on a routine basis, I think that improves. Um, but it's, you, you tend to get these very high-level sales forecasts, and you have to go back to the sales team and say, this, we can't use this. It has to get you need more detail. Okay. All right. Okay, another question. What additional things would you add to the process if you had more time, money, or people, or all of the above? Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I, we, we, we try and have our capital budgeting intertwined with the, with the budgeting process throughout, so that at the end of the day we get a capital plan. Um, it's not as rigorous as it could be, and that's something we want to improve dramatically. Um, add to it. Um, I think uh, to um, Walter's point, we want to increase the level of sophistication we have in terms of drivers. So every iteration, every year we do this, we get more sophisticated in terms of identifying drivers and, and building the algorithms to, to push those numbers into the budgeting. I don't know, Wal Walter, if you have any thoughts. Yeah, we're, we're also you know, seeing that constant improvement process. Um, you know, just like budgeting you know, with a you know with a tool like like you're using and our, and our client is using, really you know tends to simplify the process. And so you know, rather than putting all data into a budget, doing analysis at that level, our or you know we're we're seeing our clients you know constantly uh, simplifying, budgeting fewer line items at a more aggregate level, and then using you know the detailed GL as further analysis have, has to occur. And that that's a significant change in terms of letting go. From some of those details that that's a challenge, but that's what our, our, our clients are constantly doing is they're evaluating even the materiality of the information and and, um, and and consistently elevating it so it's more um, uh, more I guess more controllable and uh, and more um, uh, relevant. Yeah, well, one other thing, actually, I'm thinking of um, the metrics that are generated from reporting. I mean, I think there's, there's, in, we're increasingly becoming more sophisticated in terms of the, the metrics that we're adding into our budgeting reports and our budgeting tools, such that a lot of the analysis that you know you, you, you typically would have an analyst crunching numbers for a couple of days, it's, we're just automating all of that too, such that the, the, some of the silliness and, and, and the, the, the highly questionable areas that typically occur in a budgeting become very evident very fast because we're, we're making sure the metrics are available at all levels of the organization as part of that budgeting tool. Great, thank you. So, Meg, I know we're running up towards the end. Any other questions? Yeah, there? we are. The, yeah, there, there's a couple more questions and I was just going to um, tell the group, it, now is your, your opportunity. We've only got a couple more questions left. So if you have anything to ask, please type it in the question interface. In the meantime, Alan, there was a question for you, um, and this is around the True Sky solution. And, right. and one of the questions is, what you know, what does the solution cost, and how do they get more information? Oh well, I, I'm not going to give out costs because I always get my hand slapped whenever I do that because I'm on the 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 software development side of the house. I'm not on the sales side. Um, go to the website um, TrueSky.com. And you can find a ton of more information there. 
Uh, if you'd like some more information, you can either fill out the contact form on the website there or um, send me an email direct and I can have someone that actually um, knows all the, the ins and outs of that uh, give you a call um, uh, and we can go from that route uh, on the solution. But um, www.truesky.com is where you can go for more information. I'll throw in here, I mean our experience is the costs are not that significant and certainly when measured against the benefit it's, um, it's a relatively straightforward decision. It, it's not one of the more expensive financial systems that you'll be you'll be buying over your lives. Thank you for that. All right, Meg. Well, I haven't got any more questions in the interface. And Alan, do we want to give people an opportunity to the, raise their hand and ask a question directly in the last couple um, minutes? We can give that a shot if somebody wants to. Oh, I do have another question here. Um, do you have any videos that will show how the product can be used? So, Alan, that would be directed to you and, and the True Sky solution. And the same answer would be on the website. And I can't remember exactly off the top of my head what section it's under, but there are some videos out there of, of the products. So if you go to the website and under the product area, or there should be a link that would show you some videos. So uh, head out there. Uh, and I should probably know this off the top of my head, but I apologize for not. Uh, but you can find it there. Uh, one thing I think that's really important maybe we haven't mentioned is these, these things look and feel like Excel. So it really reduces the amount of training that's needed to use them. If you can yeah. use Excel, you can essentially build templates and you can complete templates and you can use and run and, and work with the reports. And that, that, that to me is a huge win. Like the, the training costs for this were minimal. Yeah, that certainly yeah that's helps. great, Walter. Thank you for that. If you've done budgeting your life, you've probably done it at least once in Excel. <laughs> All right, anything else, Meg? Uh, no, a few people thanking us for responding to your questions, so that's great. You're most welcome. Um, we'll maybe give this another minute, give people one last chance to ask questions. And I don't know if there's any wrap-up points any of you would like to cover off. I think I'm good from my point of view. I think we've hit everything. It closed well. And it looks like we don't have any more questions, so, so I think uh, we can probably wrap this up. So I want to thank everybody. We had, a, we had a very large attendance today, and I really appreciate it. Uh, people stayed, it looks like stayed engaged through the whole presentation, so that's very much appreciated. And uh, please, reminder, when you sign out, there will be a questionnaire. That's an opportunity to give us some feedback, and uh, certainly Alan and uh, Walter Walt will very much appreciate that feedback. And if you have any questions or looking for further information, you can also indicate that in the questionnaire. So once again, I want to thank everybody for wonderful attendance and attentiveness. And I'd like to thank our uh, panelists for their very useful information today. Have a great, right. great day, everybody. And we hope to see you on the next webinar, which will be uh, I, I, um, coming up soon. Certainly, there'll be some email and some information posted in LinkedIn. Thanks all.